So thank you very much for all of you for coming. Um, I got to say, I wasn't expecting this many folks to come. Um, and you all just made me much, much more nervous than I was. Um, this is a rather unique kind of talk for me to give um, in that there isn't what I would call science. Um, and it, it, there's no hard data that's in there. That's not the point of this talk. Uh, I'd like to give you an overview of what I do what I do with my graduate students, and try to help you perhaps get a little bit uh, as excited as we are about the work that we're doing and about these atmospheric particles that are in the atmosphere. So it, it turns out that everyone, uh, including my wife, hit, hates this title. Come on. Tantalizing glimpses into the lives. I really couldn't come up with anything better because I, I wouldn't say, I couldn't say understanding atmospheric aerosols because we know almost nothing about them in spite of all our efforts. Um, at one time, we considered them to be systems in stasis. They didn't change. You form the particles, they go in the air, and they do whatever they do. Well, we realize today that that is not the case. They do have real lives, and those lives depend on many, many factors, including the atmospheric conditions, but uh, the chemistry, which is what we are interested in trying to unravel. Um, but first, I'll start with just a, a little quiz. All right, so see if you can tell me what these things have in common. So this is a beautiful photo that my graduate student Rebecca took from Mount Mansfield, looking out. Uh, this is a nice sunny af September afternoon, I believe, in Beijing. Um, what has to be a main lighthouse here with the waves breaking, okay, and something that I know Joel Goldberg will appreciate, a bacon inhaler. So what do these things have in common, if you think about it? If we think about what this bacon inhaler does, that is that it mists the, the fragrance of bacon. I have no idea if it's real. I just found it on the net. But if anybody knows if it's real, let me know. Um, they all form aerosols. That is, these, uh, this, these suspensions of fine liquid or solid particles that are dispersed in the gas. All right, usually, we don't think about it when we're breathing in here. But I mean, I hate to tell you, you're breathing probably 10 to 20,000 particles for every milliliter of air that you breathe. That's, that's a lot of particles. You know, luckily, our body can, can get rid of them. Um, but these particles are everywhere. Right? And as Dwight mentioned, they do have health issues. And we are involved in that, although it's not something that I'll have the time to discuss with you today. Um, but if we think about these aerosols and how they might affect the climate, which is really it's just our focus. Again, we build instruments, we develop methodologies, and we apply to things that interest us. But we're by no means atmospheric chemists or global modelers or, or, uh, uh, or atmospheric scientists. But if we think about the annual mean particulate matter 2.5, so this is what the EPA regulates uh, as, part, as, one, as their, uh, one of their air quality standards. And this is actually satellite retrieval data that shows the concentration of this fine particulate. So these are all particles that are below 2.5 micrometers in diameter. You see that there's a, th these numbers are really not zero. They're close to zero, but they're not zero. And we really have a global distribution of this fine aerosol. And you can pick out some obvious features, like of course here we have the populated regions of China and India, uh, the northeastern US. You can see the levels of the particulate are quite elevated. The EPA limit, by the way, is a 35 micrograms per thousand liters of air uh, as a 24-hour average. But you can see that, as we might expect pollution, right, uh, we have all these very high concentrations of particulate in the atmosphere. Um, but maybe what you don't recognize is that in some cases, um, like here in Africa and, and the, uh, the Amazon rainforest, for example, we have still quite elevated concentrations of particulate. Now, these are relatively pristine regions, and we might ask where those particles come from, um, which is really going to be the focus of, of what I'll talk about today. Um, now, the EPA regulates the mass of these particulate because that's the easiest thing to measure. Um, and it's actually kind of a silly metric to use because there are many coastal regions, as you might imagine, because the waves generate these large particles, there's lots of mass in those particles. And there's a lot of coastal regions that are not in compliance simply because of the, of the sea spray. But it's difficult to measure any other 
to quantify any other parameter that we can use as a regulatory metric. So these, par these particles are, in fact, globally distributed. Um, and if we take a closer look at, what the, uh, the, at the, uh, some of the physical dimensions of these particles, what we really see is that while the EPA regulates from this line down in terms of mass, almost anywhere in the world you will find um, that particles really exist in three different size ranges. And which, range, uh, which size range they exist in really depends largely on how they were formed. So if we look over at the coarse side here, so this is 10 to 100 micrometers, that's about the diameter of a, of a human hair, not mine necessarily, but of a human hair. Um, and these large particles are formed primarily by mechanical processes. So waves breaking, uh, road wear, dust being picked up by wind. Um, and so these particles, as I'll say in a minute, uh, we lose them by sedimentation. Gravity simply pulls them down to the earth, to the surface, and we lose them. And it can do that because these are relatively massive particles. So we're not really very concerned with these mechanical, uh, with aerosols from these mechanical processes. Rather, particles can be formed in the atmosphere through chemistry. Right? That's what gets us excited. And these particles are much smaller. So you can see there's actually two modes. So this is the so-called nucleation mode. So that's the first time that we can measure that particles are formed. But that's an instrumental limitation. Right? It's not something I'm going to get into. But there's actually a fourth mode, which, are, which is called the Aitken mode. And particles are even smaller there. But these are formed through, um, through the uh, uh, reaction of organic gases or gases in the atmosphere that react with ozone or some other oxidants in our atmosphere to form new compounds that really don't want to be in the gas phase. Right? They're very low volatility. So they either condense on themselves, making new particles, or they can condense on existing particles, allowing them to grow. Um, if we, so we have, the, we have the, the, the two ways, really, that we can generate these particles. Obviously, these aren't just building up in our atmosphere. There are removal mechanisms. I already mentioned sedimentation. For these very small particles here, diffusion is actually the primary mechanism of loss. So they're so small, they're almost like molecules, that, that they're moving around so quickly that just by random impact with surfaces, they're lost. If we look, on the other hand, at this range here between 0.1 and 1 micrometers, the so-called accumulation mode, um, this is kind of the, the Goldilocks regime because these particles are too small to feel, really, the pull of gravity. They don't settle very well by sedimentation. But they're too large to really be lost by diffusion. So it turns out that rain out is the only way these particles are lost. They do form clouds. Um, and because they have the lowest removal rate, they tend to have the longest atmospheric lifetime. So meaning they have more, the most time to, to create problems in the atmosphere, all right, to impact atmospheric processes. And this is actually one of the challenges with trying to do these analyses is that if you think about it, we're, we're spanning about five orders of magnitude in size. And to find one method that will allow you to measure across that entire range uh, is not trivial. All right, but let's, coming back to the atmosphere then, um, we already saw before that particles here, clearly they reduce the visibility. So even in clean Vermont, um, we, um, we, we have particles that are getting in the way between us and what we're trying to view. So we see this haziness going along. Uh, we saw two really good examples uh, of, of uh, aerosols for, uh, for human health, if you will. That is you know, the bacon inhaler and anybody who uses an inhaler for, for asthma control, for example. So aerosols are a common way for delivering pharmaceuticals. What I'm going to concentrate on really is on the impact of aerosols on climate or how they can impact on, uh, our climate. And we're really going to look at, we're going to focus in on how the aerosols change the amount of solar radiation that reaches the Earth's surface, the so-called radiative balance. Um, as you might imagine, particles, if they're in the way, just as in your line of sight here, if they're in the way between the sun and the Earth's surface, they might scatter radiation back into the atmosphere. They might absorb the radiation and then emit it either down or up. All right? uh, in either case, <clears throat> they are reducing the amount of sunlight that reaches the Earth's surface. And in fact, the community has taken to 
uh, saying that aerosols tend to be global dimmers, balancing global warming, which is a really dangerous thing because they, they don't balance global warming. Uh, we know very little about the magnitude of this so-called direct effect. So it's a direct interaction of the particles with the sunlight. And even though we know, we know very little about this effect, we know even less about these so-called indirect effects. So again, these particles, they're in the atmosphere, there's lots of humidity around, they can take on water, form clouds. And as we can see, especially today, if we have clouds, we have less sunlight reaching the Earth's surface. Again, global dimming. And for us, the unifying factor between these direct and indirect effects is that they're both dependent, at least in part, on the chemistry of these particles. All right. In order for these particles to become cloud droplets, they have to take on water, which means they have to be hydrophilic. All right. And that's going to depend on the chemistry. The wavelengths that are absorbed or scattered depend on the molecules that make up those, uh, those particles. So if we focus down uh, a little bit here and we look at just the fine mode. So again, we're looking at PM 2.5 and below. Um, oh, you can kind of see that. Uh, PM 2.5 and below, if we were to break it up, in this, if we were to break this pie into organic, so these are particles that contain mainly molecules made up of carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, um, and inorganic particles, which you can think of as salts. We actually find that between 20 and 90% of the mass of these particles is organic in nature, which was a surprise about 15, 20 years ago. It was never something that was considered. Um, and there's actually this large variability here uh, of 20 to 90% for several reasons. One, obviously we're gonna have regional differences depending on whether we're measuring above a forest canopy or we're measuring in, in downtown New York City. Um, we're gonna have a different distribution of organic and inorganic. But there's also uncertainties in our abilities to measure the mass of these particulate. Um, and even worse, the models that we're using to try and predict what these concentrations are globally um, really suffer some major uh, uh, disadvantages that I'll discuss uh, in a second. If we kind of drill in a little bit now and look at just the organic fraction, <coughs> we see that um, that organic aerosol is, actually consists of two classes, if you will, uh, and these are defined by how the, how the particles are formed. That is, whether they are <clears throat> emitted directly into the atmosphere, so-called primary organic particles here, and you can see that's a very small portion of it, or whether the particles themselves are formed chemically in the atmosphere. Right? And we refer to these as secondary organic particles secondary because they are formed in the atmosphere as opposed to being directly emitted. And if we look at this pie, 70 to 90 percent of the mass of the organic fraction, which is 20 to 90 percent of the total fine particulate mass in the atmosphere, is secondary in nature. So see if you can guess where we focus our work. We're really looking at secondary organic aerosols, trying to understand their chemistry, trying to understand how they form, how they age and react in the atmosphere, and how they, interact with, how, how they interact differently with sunlight, perhaps, based on how they were formed. Um, so this, to look at it from up on high, really, uh, and, and making it as, as uh, I don't want to say simple, as straightforward as possible, um, really secondary organic aerosols, they have both biogenic, so natural sources, and anthropogenic sources. But by and large, the, uh, the biogenic sources dominate. So all trees, all leafy plants, grasses, they emit a class of compounds called terpenes. And these terpenes are very reactive. And, um, Red, have you got the show and tell time? So I always tell my students the most dangerous thing we work with is water, and any chemicals we use have to smell nice. So she's actually passing around, if you just waft that under your, there's nothing dangerous about them, honest. You just waft them under your, except you, Jim, just waft them under your nose and you can smell two of the compounds that we work with, limonene, which is emitted predominantly through citrus uh, trees, and uh, hexenol, which is a compound that we discovered that is emitted when you mow lawns. And both of these are very active and contribute to atmospheric aerosol. So by and large, we focus on the biogenic sources. So these trees, they're always emitting these volatile organic compounds, or VOCs,
Um, so these are compounds that want to be in the gas phase. They react with uh, atmospheric oxidants, and there's a slew of them, but really we focus on ozone for several practical reasons and because it is the primary uh, oxidant for this class of compounds. <clears throat> So when these VOCs are oxidized, you form products. You're basically adding oxygen to the molecules. And you form products that are lower volatility. All right? So they don't want to be in the gas phase as much anymore. And if they don't want to be in the gas phase, they really have two options. They can nucleate or condense, which I mentioned before leads to those very small particles uh, below 100 nanometers. But these volatile, semi-volatile vapors can also partition. Right. Partition is just a fancy way of saying that they spend, sort of like the snowbirds, half their time in the gas phase and half their time in the particle phase. Um, and this partitioning is very dependent, is critically dependent on the phase of the particles, on the viscosity of those particles. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later. But really, what, what's been guiding our research is this discrepancy here. That is, we have decent measurements, or at least we think we have decent measurements of the mass of secondary organic aerosol in the atmosphere. The modelers believe that they have a decent handle on predicting how much SOA mass should be out there. And unfortunately, the measured SOA loading, or secondary organic aerosol, and by loading I'm just thinking, I'm just trying to uh, uh, indicate the amount of aerosol mass that's in the atmosphere, but the me measured amounts are between 10 and 100 times greater than the modeled amounts. So there's something missing somewhere. And when we brainstorm and try to think about what those things might be, well, clearly there's either something missing from the measured values or there's some bad assumptions on the models. Um, how can we go about trying to decrease that discrepancy? Um, and really, we had three goals to try to do this. One, we are firm believers that you can't simply look at the chemistry as a bulk property, which is what models do out of necessity. Right? The computing power simply isn't there to treat every single chemical reaction that's occurring in the atmosphere. Um, but people have taken liberties in, in extrapolating from these bulk measurements to things like the amount of light that's scattered or the amount of light that's absorbed. And we don't think you can do that. We think you really need to have a molecular level understanding of what's happening and what's in those particles. Um, obviously, there may be some missing SOA precursors that aren't being included in the models. Okay? That's kind of low-hanging fruit there. Um, and finally, because this partition is either is, is the redistribution of these vapors onto the aerosol, it's going to change the amount of aerosol mass that you can have. So this partitioning is very important. And that partitioning, as I said, we like to break it up into whether the particles are liquid or solid. But really, it's a spectrum. And I'll talk about that at the very end. Um, so the challenges that we really had to face were that we have very low mass that we're trying to analyze. So remember, this is the region that we're trying to measure in. This is the accumulation mode. And if you think that a one micrometer particle has about a picogram, <clears throat> 10 to the minus 12 grams of total mass. So if it was a pure compound, that's how much mass you'd have to analyze. You'd have to measure. All right? So that's one trillionth of a gram. But if we think that, on the other hand, that these particles are composed of multiple chemicals, it actually turns out that they have hundreds or thousands of different chemicals. Now you're taking that one picogram and distributing it over 100 different compounds or 1,000 different compounds. So you have even less mass of each compound that you're trying to measure. Um, the other thing is, as I said, the, these are chemically complex. How do we get the chemical information? If we want to do molecular level analysis, how do we get that information out? And alpha pinene here is one of the predominant terpenes that's emitted, so it's become the poster child. Um, and aerosol mass spectrometry was something that started to come out while I was working in Italy, and that's what got me into the field. Um, but th there's two ways we can do aerosol mass spectrometry, so-called hard, and it really doesn't, it's not important what exactly that means, but what we're doing with hard is that we're breaking the molecules. So this alpha pinene, if we plot a, an abundance of a certain molecule versus the weight of that molecule. If I have a pure particle, I should see one thing, which is the molecular weight of that molecule. But when we use traditional or conventional aerosol mass spectrometry that is a very hard 
hard method of analysis, this is what we see. So for one compound that we should have seen one signal here, we see all of these fragments of that molecule. Now we'd have to try and figure out how to, how to do this puzzle, if you will. That is, we have all of these pieces. How do we put them together? All right, so this is like a 5,000 piece puzzle um, that you're trying to do without having the picture. And maybe even after a couple of glasses of wine, it becomes a little difficult. What we pioneered is this method of soft ionization. That is, our goal was to keep all the molecules intact when we did the chemical analysis. So this, believe it or not, is the same particle as this. That is alpha pinene that's been reacted with ozone. And again, the green here is where that compound would be. And we see many products, many chemical products. Again, each one of these lines is the abundance of a molecule of that weight, which we can then relate to the, to the chemical structure, if you will. Um, so this soft ionization really simplifies our problem. You know, now we've gone to a, maybe a 50-piece puzzle, uh, you know, one of those floor puzzles for the kids, and, and you'd be doing it while you're drinking your first glass of wine. A little more doable. You still don't have the picture. You still don't know what you're supposed to get in the end. Um, but the simplicity uh, really helps. And this is the only slide I have of our, of our instrument, uh, even though I'm very proud of it. Um, and for lack of any sort of imagination on my part, we call it a near-infrared laser desorption ionization aerosol mass spectrometer. Another one of those names. Uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how to do th short words, uh, but this is a, so it's a near IR LDI. And again, we developed it with the express um, goals of keeping the, keeping the molecules intact so we can do a chemical composition and trying to see those very, very low minute amounts of mass that we're trying to measure. And just briefly, so here we have our atmospheric aerosol. We sample it through something that's called an aerodynamic lens that makes a beam of particles. We collect those particles on an aluminum probe, <clears throat> excuse me, and then we fire a near-infrared laser. These are very common. They're actually very inexpensive. We vaporize and ionize those particle components, and then we do chemical analysis by traditional time-of-flight mass spectrometry. Um, this is actually what the beam, what the particle beam looks like. So this is the exit of the particle inlet. Excuse me. So the particles are moving left to right. And counter-propagating to that, we have a green laser. So everywhere those two beams inter um, cross, you actually get scatter and you see the light. So you're really looking at a photograph of those particles. <clears throat> and some pictures, not pretty, but this is the, uh, one of the instruments that we built. This is the green where you see the particle beam is going from left to right. Um, and they're not pretty pictures, but hopefully it gives you an idea of the, the challenge and, and the work that went into uh, developing these and, and putting, putting these systems together, mostly by my graduate students. I have to give credit there. Um, so we've worked with this for many years now. We know it's capable of doing the chemical analysis at the levels we want and with, with the um, level of softness that we need to keep the molecules intact. Um, but that instrument is part of uh, an entire research infrastructure that we were, we've been able to put together through uh, the generous contributions of the National Science Foundation and others, uh, where we have the University of Vermont Environmental Chamber, or UVMEC. It's an 8,000 liter chamber. And around this chamber, we have a whole suite of instruments that we've either developed or they're commercial instruments, and tried to color code them here for gas phase analysis, uh, the LP and the, and then, I'm sorry, the LP and the uh, S SMPS here, these measure physically the size distributions of these aerosols um, and, and so on. And we can do optical uh, characterization of these particles as well. But again, I won't talk about that today. So as I mentioned, this is what we're trying to decrease, this discrepancy between the two. And now we have an instrument that allows us to look at the molecular level chemistry going on. And one of the first things we applied it to was, hey, are there some other precursors out there, some other volatile compounds that we've never thought about that could be making particles. And in fact, it all came about when I was mowing my lawn. Uh, I mean, we all know that fresh lawn smell, right? You can get it from one of those vials. But so those are very aromatic compounds when you mow the lawn. And all of the terpenes are also very aromatic, that is, from, from a sensory uh, perspective. So I wondered if all the stuff that I was throwing into the air there, all of those volatile compounds, could form particulate. 
And of course, after the fact, we saw that in, in fact, these compounds here are emitted in great quantities by any kind of leafy plants. Um, and their main role is as a response to stress and in plant plant or plant uh, insect signaling. So what I did was I took some clippings a few summers ago, actually. Um, we, and Rebecca was waiting with bated breath at the lab. We put the clippings inside the chamber. We let them stew for a little bit. And then Rebecca started measuring what was in the gas phase. And what she found, again, now each one of these peaks is a different compound that's in the gas phase. And she was able to identify these compounds through various uh, methods that we use. But of course, the question is, will they react with ozone to make aerosol? And so the next thing to do is to burp in a little bit of ozone. And in fact, this is what's in the gas phase after we introduce the ozone. So you can see some peaks have completely disappeared. We completely consumed those, those compounds from the gas phase. And new ones have shown up, meaning we've made different phase, uh, gas phase products. But for us, the exciting part was if we look at the amount of aerosol that was formed. So here we're looking again at the size distribution of the aerosol that's formed. So we have the number of particles on the y-axis and the, the diameter of those particles on the x-axis. And it was lots and lots and lots of particles. So we thought this is something that we really need to study. And in fact, Rebecca just completed her PhD thesis on this project a couple of, a couple of weeks ago already. And one of my other graduate students, Shash, will be completing also on this project. So it turned out to be a good summer day of mowing the lawn. Um, if we take this aerosol now and we want to look at the chemical composition, we see things like this. So these are two of the compounds that we know is emitted by the leafy plants, by the grass clippings. We buy the standards, we inject them independently inside our chamber and we put in ozone and we measure the chemistry of the particles. Again, I want to stress that each one of these lines or peaks is indicative of the abundance of a given type of molecule. So we can literally just add that up and say, OK, this has to be made up of carbon, oxygen, hydrogen. What could it be? And looking at that relatively simple mass spectrum, uh, we're able to come up with some chemical mechanisms that tell us the molecular pathway of getting from the gas phase to the particle phase for these compounds. And I'll give you a second to study those, but um, they, they, that was a joke, um, just, just in case. Um, but really, th this is important, not because of the detail, really, but because that chemical detail allows us to determine the type of reaction that's going on, if you will. So for this particular compound, it's an oligomerization reaction, meaning we're just adding molecule to a tail of a molecule to a tail of a molecule and so on. We're essentially making little bouncy springs. Whereas for this molecule, just looking at the chemical composition of the particles, you can see that they're completely different. But here, we saw that the, the oligomerization was actually shut down. So we would not expect these particles to be bouncy. All right? Um, so following along with that then, we can do the chemical analysis. We can find missing precursors. But now we have to figure out how do we know that, I mean, that chemical clue there told us that perhaps one of those SOA sources made one kind of particle, bouncy, and the other one made non-bouncy. Um, and those are the only terms I can use because any scientific terms I use are argued by every reviewer that we have. Um, so how do we go about determining how thick these particles are, how viscous, or how fluid they are? All right. So just to give you a little primer on viscosity, right? so this is the ability of molecules to flow past each other, uh, here's a scale of, some, of viscosity based on some known substances going from water, olive oil, honey, all the way up to a glass marble. Now you can imagine if these were particles made up of these substances, they would behave completely differently in the atmosphere. Right? Ozone would, would permeate a droplet of water very quickly throughout the entire droplet. It would not do that to a glass marble. It would be limited to the surface. Um, of course, we're in Vermont, so I wanted to put the Vermont reference of viscosity there. So we have pure Vermont maple syrup between olive oil and honey. And as Dwight mentioned, I was in Canada. I didn't want to forget our friends to the north. So there's the Canadian pure maple syrup. <laughs> a lot of people didn't get the joke, so I was a little worried. Um, but anyway. <laughs> 
the point being that how do we gauge how viscous these particles are so that we know to tell the modelers, here's how you should treat these in the models with, re with regards to partitioning. Because if you look at liquid particles, <clears throat> if you look at liquid particles, as I mentioned, if a gas is going to react with it, that gas is going to quickly diffuse into the center. There's really nothing holding it back. And we get what we call bulk chemistry. The entire particle is acting as, as one entity. If, on the other hand, we're at the other end of the spectrum, like the glass marble, then we might have a scenario like this. And again, solid is in quotes because there's a specific definition for solid. And we didn't make specific measurements of, of viscosity. Um, but here, you, you might expect that the ozone, these are little ozone molecules, that the ozone is going to be relegated to the surface. And we get mainly surface-mediated chemistry as opposed to bulk chemistry. And here, we have slow or no diffusion. So these are two completely different scenarios. Now the question is, how do we figure out which scenario is at play for any given chemical system? And what we did was actually take advantage of a limitation of a, 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 the, the conventional method of making aerosol measurements, which is to accelerate particles towards a filter, for example, or towards some flat surface. And hopefully, they'll splat and they'll stick. And then after a week of doing that, you wash them off and you do your chemical analysis. But one of the big problems that those types of instruments, they're called cascade impactors, that, that, that they have is particle bounce. Sometimes when that particle is accelerated towards a plate, it doesn't go splat, it goes boing, falls off, bounces off, and moves on. And the, the scientific community tried, uh, not, uh, spent a lot of effort trying to reduce that bounce. And we actually tried to flip that on its head, and I'll show you in a second how we did that. So if we have liquid particles that are going into this cascade impactor, so we actually have 15 of these impaction stages in turn, and the particles are accelerated more and more as you go down. So typically, we collect large particles on the first. So here we have particle diameter, and we collect large particles on the first stages, and we collect small particles at subsequent stages. So if we look at the number of particles here as a function of diameter for these liquids, which should splat on every stage, we would get a distribution that perhaps looked like this, with 100 nanometers being the peak of that distribution. If we did the exact same measurement with solid particles, if they all went splat, we would see the same kind of distribution. So now here, a dioctyl sebicate is a reference for a liquid particle. Ammonium sulfate is a reference for a solid particle. But that's not what we see. So we set up the system so that it either shut down bounce completely, or it favored bounce. So if something was going to bounce, we were going to see it. And when we compare the dioctyl sebicate, the liquid particles, as they're measured with the system to favor bounce, not surprisingly, we see the exact same distribution. Because they, there's no way they're going to bounce. They're liquid. If we do that with ammonium sulfate, on the other hand, you see that all the particles that should have been counted at these earlier stages as bigger particles are now all being counted as smaller particles, meaning they've bounced all the way down. So we've tried to maximize this, this loss due to bounce and use it as a surrogate for viscosity, uh, really is what we're doing. And if I show you some real data that we, that we took, so for example here, so from this data, we can calculate a bounce factor, right, which again, we relate to the viscosity of the particles. Um, so if we inject dioctyl sebicate into our UV mech, that's these pink, uh, pink symbols here, the bounce factor is zero, just as we expect. We know it's a liquid. If, on the other hand, we inject ammonium sulfate, so these are the open squares, we know it's a solid. We know we're going to get significant bounce. Uh, and I won't go into why it tails off, but that's something that is very interesting to us. What was really surprising to us is here we have a reference for a solid particle. This is aerosol that was formed with alpha pinene, again, one of these terpenes, after it reacted with ozone. And it has a larger bounce factor than our solid reference, which was what makes us think of the super balls, right? These, these polymeric, poly, polymeric chains that are causing those particles to be really susceptible to bounce. So it's giving us some information about, about the viscosity of the particles. And just to show that we could actually I said these are the lives of these particles that, I mean, they're living, they're changing as a function of time, they're changing as a function of humidity and so on, and time. The green symbols here are oleic acid particles. 
which we generate, so it's a primary organic particle, organic aerosol, and we know it's a liquid. Right? It's the main component in olive oil. And at time 45 minutes here, we injected a little bit of ozone. And all of a sudden, these liquid particles are not entirely liquid anymore. They're actually showing a significant increase in the bounce fraction. So this work all came about from some observations we made with our instrument that we simply could not interpret unless we assumed the particles were solid, or at least non-liquid. It took us, <laughs> took us a while to convince the community that, what, that that was, the, in fact, the case. So now we have to really start thinking about the viscosity and how it's treated in models. We have to start thinking about the specific molecular structure of a compound and how it's going to react to form what types of products. Will those products take on water? Will they absorb light? This is, these are all unknowns. Again, people ask me what it is I have against modelers. I, I've got nothing against modelers. Uh, they're doing the best they can with the tools they have. But unfortunately, we're never going to be able to make accurate predictions unless we start to take some of these factors into account in those models. So I started it with how our thinking has changed based on some of the stuff that we've done. And uh, I suppose I'll just point out that we found very easily one missing source of soil in the atmosphere. There's lots more out there. Um, I don't know whether anyone will ever make a, an inventory of these, of these but uh, who knows. But for us, uh, we like exploratory research. This was something new, it had never been done, so we did it. So these emissions from the green leafy plants are actually called green leaf volatiles. It's another class of volatile organic compounds. And that's just one example. Um, importantly, soa particles, which conventionally were always thought of to be liquid in atmospheric conditions, are not. And that's going to change our thinking of the impact during their life cycle in terms of what they're going to do in the atmosphere. And that phase is actually a complex function of the atmospheric conditions, the temperature, chemistry, time, uh, whether it's a Monday or a Tuesday, it's all there. Um, and something that I haven't I had the chance to touch on, really, but it's that the optical and physical properties of the SOA, right? so I didn't really talk about optical, but again, we cannot predict them with conventional methods of analysis, which do not look at the molecular level detail of the chemical composition. Um, so we're really, these molecular, uh, yeah, these molecular level analyses are going to require new innovative instrumentation. We still, our goal was to do this on a single particle basis. We have not achieved that goal. I hope someday we do or someone else does uh, because that's critical. Uh, but this molecular level understanding is required in order to adequ adequately model these systems. Uh, and as I say, this is going to require some really innovative technology to achieve. Uh, likely not during my professional career, but we'll give it a shot. And this is one of my favorite quotes from John Aitken. In fact, they named that smallest mode that I didn't show you after him, where it says, we have in this fine dust a most beautiful illustration how, of how the little things in the world can work great effects, simply by the virtue of their numbers. And the key word here is numbers, because this accumulation mode has lots and lots and lots of particles, very little mass. Therefore, it's not regulated. It's difficult to study. Um, so of course, I have to thank my group. This was a sunny day in Vermont. Um, now these folks are all gone. That's my son, who's going to come to UVM next year. Um, <laughs> and uh, these are the rest of the group members. So Shash, as I mentioned, did a lot of the work on, on the uh, GLVs. Rebecca also, who just finished, she's off to Purdue to pursue a postdoc, flying in airplanes, making measurements. And, and so on. So she's really excited about that. Um, and of course, I have to thank the funding agencies. Um, we do get some funding from NASA, but the bulk of our funding is, in fact, from the National Science Foundation, and EPSCoR has helped out tremendously. So with that, I'm happy to take any questions. <laughs>